Good evening and welcome to Altos, your weekly Catholic news program here on Trinity TV and now showing on the national television station TTT. I'm Neil Parsonlal. Here's a look at this week's top stories. 98% of Pity Martinique's housing stock has been reduced to rubble by Hurricane Beryl. Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon urges the region to give generously to those suffering from the devastation of Hurricane Beryl. Come back home. Father Robert Christo issues a heartfelt plea to Roman Catholics who have left the church. And later, we speak with the Prime Minister of Grenada, Deacon Mitchell, who says it's hard not to cry as Grenada and its dependencies pick up the pieces after being ravaged by Beryl. And now to our top story. It's now almost two weeks since the Grenadian islands of Cariacou and Pity Martinique sustained severe damage due to Hurricane Beryl, and the islands have a long journey ahead of them before any form of normalcy returns. Kleisha Best prepared this report on the situation there. The situation on the island of Pitta Martinique in particular has been described by one regional coordinator as a depressing, overwhelming site which will take years to reset. Another said it looks like a dumping ground for galvanized and debris which is scattered everywhere by the hurricane force winds of Beryl. Communication has been restored, but with expected issues. We spoke to Father Hugh Logan, who is currently on the ground assisting with the recovery efforts in Pitti Martinique. He said the people are slowly trying to put their lives back together. To see the island firsthand uh, with your very own eyes is very overwhelming. You wonder, will things get back um, to a normal? Um, it will take a year, but it really, really can be depressing. Um, the people here are not lost their faith. Uh, they are thanking God for the gift of life. And they, they continue, as I've been seeing, they have not been just sitting there doing nothing. They have been trying to see what they can do to um, make life better for them here in Peter Martin. Father Hugh also noted that the Sisters of the Sorrowful Mother are set to journey there to offer counselling and support. Meanwhile, Dwight Logan, the District Coordinator at the National Disaster Management Agency in Pitti Martinique, better known as NADMA, said while the donations have been coming in from the CARICOM community, a lot more is needed. And there, there's a rumour that there's a lot of food on the island. This is not so. This is not so. Please, we need your help in terms of food stock, in terms of solar lights, in terms of building material as we go forward. Now, and we are asking you, channel this to NADMA, either NADMA Grenada, NADMA Caribou, NADMA Pitti Martinique. Spokesperson for the NADMA team, Dr. Dawn Dekoto, is also calling for additional manpower. We need, we, we've adopted a phrase, help a house. Yes. So if you're coming up to Grenada now, <coughs> what we need, get, bring your water, bring your quicks, but what we need, we need the bolts to bring plywood, we need them to bring the nails, the screws, the tools. Galvanize. Galvanize. I am Kleisha Best for Catholic News Altos. President of the Antilles Episcopal Conference, Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon, says the Caribbean has to realize it has to live with the spirituality of hurricanes. And he's appealing to the people of the region to really dig deep to those to help those affected by Hurricane Beryl. In a video recording, appealing for help for those ravaged by Beryl, His Grace admitted that the concept of spirituality of hurricanes is difficult to understand. But he said, with hurricanes becoming more fierce and ferocious, we need to understand that we are vulnerable. We here at Altos join the Archbishop in urging everyone to give generously to this relief effort. And hurricane relief efforts in this archdiocese are being coordinated by a committee appointed by Archbishop Gordon. The committee comprises Nigel Philip of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, Ron Mengo of the Living Water Community, and Deborah de Rosier of the Eternal Light Community. In a letter sent to priests and parish coordinators and signed by de Rosier, parishes have been asked to organize teams who will undertake the collection, sorting, packaging, and transporting of the items to the various posts as required. Parish communities have been advised to look out for the details of the information from the committee from their parish priests and vicariate offices. 
And here's an appeal that's similar. Vicar for Communications, Father Robert Christou, has urged Roman Catholics who have left the fold to return to the church. And he's also urging the Roman Catholic community to accept the thorns in their lives, saying this is what gives them power from God. Delivering the homily at his final mass at the St. Dominic's R.C. Church in Pinal on Sunday, Father Christo urged the congregation to hold on to their faith. Catholic News Editor Raymond Sims has more in this report. As the congregation made their way into St. Dominic's R.C. Church in Pinal, no one was left in any doubt that this was a celebration of love and appreciation for a much-beloved priest. Father Robert Christo, who was bidding adieu as he left after six and a half years to take up his new assignment as parish priest in Arima. The church was packed to capacity on a day celebrating not only Father Christo, but also the annual harvest in the parish and welcoming the new. We thank God and we celebrate today. Want to give a round of applause to Father Orhe, all the way from Venezuela. We want to pray for our Father Peter from Nigeria. In capable hands, we have our church. Give him a round of applause and a good penal welcome. Delivering the homily, Father Christo spoke of several experiences he has had in his ministry. He reminded the congregation that every person baptized in the Catholic Church was baptized as priest, prophet, and king, and that all that we have and can do comes from the Spirit of God. The Spirit in you, inside of you, from your baptism soul, have power. I give you power to touch people, raise dead, and then you all gaze in, and you come in, and you're attending, and you're not utilizing. We will come to just now. Something is give you tone, and if you hide the tone, you hide the power. Father Christo had a message for those who have left the church, telling them, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. And if you're not in a ministry in the church, you're not home. Come back home. Home is church. If you miss church and you don't live church, you go bury church. In keeping with the celebratory theme, intercessions of prayer were done in song by several young people. Bless our leaders as they rule and guide. Let but our judgment be a last and strive to make our country remember to praise the Trinity. We, we pray, pray to the Lord. Lord. I am Raymond Sims for Catholic News Altos. Newly procured police vehicles received a blessing from Father David Kahn, the parish priest of Our Lady of Perpetual Help in San Fernando. A Facebook video via the San Fernando City Corporation showed Father Kahn blessing the fleet on July 8th at the San Fernando City Police Station. Father Kahn invoked divine protection and guidance for the vehicles and those who will operate them. The government has launched another anti-crime initiative, and this one is aimed at using song and music to steer young people away from a life of crime. The Call to Order initiative was launched using the song The Call by local reggae singers Marvin King, who goes by the sobriquet Mr. King, I Sasha, Brandon Young, King David, David Neves, Ziggy Ranking, Corey Francis and Prophet Benjamin, Devon Samuel. The Call to Order initiative takes the form of a music competition which will be in three categories for youths ages 8 to 12, 13 to 19, and 20 to 24. Lyrics will be on ending violence and the participants will be judged by likes and shares on the social media platform Instagram. National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines is hoping that the initiative will encourage young people to take a stand against crime and violence. Mr. King, Marvin Lewis, said the team and, and those who recorded the call were happy that the government was using their song as a basis for change, to change the crime situation in the country. The competition winner for each category will benefit from a recording session, video production, and a trophy. And the second and third place groups will each receive a trophy. It's time now for us to take a short break, and when we return, we speak with Prime Minister of Grenada, the Honorable Deacon Mitchell, as he pieces his country back together. Before we go, have a look at this week's trivia question. Prime Minister, thanks very much for, for taking the time from your, from your obviously very busy schedule 
to be with us on Altos this morning. We wanted to get a sense from you in terms of the, the, the destruction that would have taken place in Grenada and, and, and its dependencies. The, you would have experienced Ivan 20 years ago as a, as a youth. 20 years later, you're experiencing Beryl as a prime minister. How has that experience been for you? Well, thank you for having me and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I think, you know, as a young person, uh, two years out from university, 20 years ago, um, I don't know that I reflected a lot on the, the ravages of, of Ivan. It was devastating. It hit mainland Grenada and, uh, you know, all around was destruction. So I spent in the immediate aftermath and for several months, a lot of my time helping with the distribution of relief. I volunteered with things like the Rotary Club um, and all of the other relief agencies, uh, Samaritan's Post and others who spent a lot of time just simply going around, helping to clean up, helping to distribute uh, relief supplies, helping to put tarpaulins on people's homes, etc. Um, it was a very rewarding experience and it also taught me that despite the significant damage that Ivan had done to the psyche and to the physical landscape of Grenada, that we could rebuild and we were resilient. Um, and that there were several lessons that we would have had to learn from that that period. Grenada had not been hit by a hurricane in, in 50 plus years. The last one was 1955. Um, and so the theory then was that you'd probably get hit by a Category 3 or Category 4 hurricane once in every 50 years. Every 50 years. And that people could perhaps live with those odds. The reality is uh, by 2005, a couple of months later, we got into another hurricane, Hurricane Emily, uh, also in July. Uh, that was July 8. Thankfully, the damage was not as catastrophic as, as Ivan, and in any event, the place had been damaged badly enough. Yeah. Um, there was, in a sense, not much left for Emily to do. Fast forward today, uh, and again, early July, almost June, really, um, we've been hit with a devastating Category 4, almost Category 5 hurricane. Mm -hmm. Um, which has devastated Caribou and Piti Martinique and has done significant damage to the north of the island. Now, luckily for us, uh, the south and the eastern parts of the island were, I would say, largely spared, and to some extent, we dodged a bullet there. Um, and that has allowed Grenada to be able to respond a lot more effectively, uh, particularly with treating with the, the northern part of the island and Caribou and Piti Martinique. Mm -hmm. I shudder to think if we had the same level of destruction in Grenada as we have in Caribou and Piti Martinique, what would become of us? Because there is no question that the task of rebuilding, cleaning up, and uh, restoring the psyche of all people would be a lot more difficult if the entire island had been, island of Grenada, that is, had been devastated. So for me as a, a prime minister, I think having gone through the experience of, of Ivan, uh, it led me in, in good stead to be able to appreciate that there are a number of things we need to do. One was to make sure from a preparation point of view, even though we didn't have a lot of time, that we needed to communicate repeatedly and consistently with the public about the dangers of the hurricane, about the need to be prepared, the need to have the shelters open, the need to go into the shelters ahead of the hurricane, not, not after or during. Um, and then the need to make sure that from a communication point of view, that we can communicate to the public as quickly as possible after the, the event. Uh, the need to make sure that the security forces were prepared because we had a lot of looting and, a, you know, in a sense, a breakdown of law and order in the immediate aftermath of Ivan. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the security forces were prepared, um, first to look after themselves and their families, and then second, to make sure uh, that they could do their jobs and ensure that the population remained calm and that people uh, did not panic and did not have to engage in, in any unlawfulness. That was uh, successful, and I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, the Commission of Police and his team the Commission of Prisons and his team, uh, because in, in Ivan, uh, we had a wholesale jailbreak because yes. the prisons were, were impacted as, as well. Um, from the perspective of uh, uh, regional support uh, throughout this process, uh, right from the beginning, or NADMA, the National Disaster Management Agency, and CDEMA, uh, together with other regional partners, uh, other prime ministers, uh, CARICOM uh, prime ministers whose countries were likely to be impacted with constant communication, we were doing Zoom meetings, we were exchanging notes, we were preparing, we were activating uh, because we recognized there was a real probability that the storm would make landfall. So that I think also worked well and has helped with the immediate post uh, relief and, and coordination. Uh, obviously, notwithstanding those things, going through this is still a harrowing experience. 
and particularly for the areas that are, that are damaged. Um, you know, it's, it's got wrenching and depressing, really, to see the level of destruction and damage and the level of cleanup and so on that we, that we have there, to... There was one report that said that Pity Martinique was almost like a garbage dump now. The, or, or a dump for the you know for, for for material any any thoughts on the the extent of the devastation in those islands how would you on a scale of one to ten you know percentage wise how bad is it on a scale of one to ten it's a nine it's a nine um you know and, and it's a it's it's not a ten merely because you know there are one or two buildings that have yes, survived one or two buildings, yes. um you know uh probably either just lucky because of the, the wind that missed it, uh, because I guess mm -hmm. within the wind, you probably have a tornado like effect, um, or because uh, the construction methodologies uh, were, were, were better. Um, but, you know, largely public infrastructure, roads, the coastline, the mangroves, uh, vegetation, uh, all of the vegetation, um, agriculture, you know, 80 to 90 percent of, of homes, I mean, there are homes that have been completely destroyed, not just the roof is gone. I mean, the entire, the entire building house. has collapsed. Uh, there are public buildings that have completely collapsed. Uh, in in Karakou, there's the, the Dover Government School. And when I say collapse, the only thing left is the, 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 the wall slab. The entire school has crumbled. Um, you know, so we, we it's the airport, uh, the port, uh, the Turtle Bay Marina. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not a situation where it's the southern part or the northern part of the island. It's it's devastation throughout Caribou, the, the uh, devastation throughout, throughout Piti Martinique. And if you're flying have, from have, there... Have you been able to does, quantify the, the, the damages as yet and what it what it would take to repair? Uh, we, we expect to receive the rapid uh, damage assessment uh, today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I have uh, resisted uh, wanting to put dollar figures to it um, by simply... You know, sort of doing an estimate. We can tell you, for example, that ninety percent of the, the housing stock in Cairo and, and Piti Martinique is, is is damaged or destroyed, and it's easy to extrapolate from that the, the fact that you need hundreds of millions of dollars. And yeah. I could give a simple example: if we have to rebuild, and we will, one thousand homes uh, at a minimum, the average cost of a two-bedroom house, very modest house in 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 Grenada, is two hundred thousand. So if you had to build a thousand homes at two hundred thousand, uh, that's two hundred million dollars right there. Yes. So we certainly expect uh, that the damage will be in the hundreds of millions of, of dollars. Um, and it's not just housing, we're talking agriculture, aquaculture, mariculture, for example, or CMOS uh, farmers who, who ply the trade on the eastern coast. All of their CMOS is completely destroyed. Um, you know, so there's significant damage to agriculture as well. well the, one of the things that have come, come forward is that this has been, the barrel has broken all records, is the first storm so, so early, the first category of you know, four into, into five storm. And people talk about, the, the, the experts are telling us about the warming of the seas. The sea surface temperature that we are facing now is what we'd expect in, in, in September. How much of, of this is climate change? How much of this is attributed to climate change? And, and what can we do? And why, and I know you, 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 you said a couple of things in terms of, of us, the smaller islands, paying for the extravagance of, of, of the North. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that whole climate change, the, the impact, and what are your thoughts on, on what should happen going forward? Right. Well, I think there are a couple of things that we could point uh, to that are uh, self-obvious and demonstrable. You know, I started off by indicating that uh, Grenada had a hurricane in 1955, mm -hmm. and that for 50 years thereafter, there was no major hurricane uh, to hit the island. And so the, the, the science and the, the, the facts then were that you were looking at probably one in every 50, 50 years. And then we got hit in 2004, we got hit in 2005. We've now been hit in, in, in 2024 uh, and we've been hit in, in July. And as you said, the storm has broken all records. I don't think that there is any question that the warming of the ocean surface uh, is contributing to this and that the warming of the ocean surface uh, is largely as a result of uh, the burning of hydrocarbons, um, the wholesale use of hydrocarbons worldwide uh, and that to a large extent, the industrial revolution and modern society has been built on a single source of energy, which is uh, petroleum related products. Um, and uh, therefore you have a situation where it's not just the warming of the ocean uh, and the fueling of storms, but the fact that in the Caribbean, it is killing our coral reefs. Uh, it is making our fish stock be at risk because the warmer the temperatures, the, 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 the greater it is that uh, you have the growth of algae, uh, you have the massive sargassum problem that we are facing um, again, because the, the ocean is, is, is warming and it's fueling the growth of these things. So 
all of the, the, the indicators uh, point to the fact that uh, we're in July. The seas at temperatures that you'd expect in, in September and in August. So it therefore means that there's more energy for these storms to be to form. Uh, and they are forming, in a sense, it's no longer they're forming and they're heading to the northern Rhode Islands or Jamaica or Cayman or Cuba. Uh, Trinidad was threatened. Uh, uh, Venezuela had significant damage from the, 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 the hurricane as well. So it, it therefore means the entire belt uh, from the northern coast of uh, South America all the way up to the southern coast of North America is now a hurricane, a hurricane zone. There's no safe path anymore. So to me, the indications are absolutely clear. Uh, that this is linked to the climatic changes and uh, very dramatic um, and unpredictable climatic events as well. Now, Grenada actually was experiencing severe drought-like conditions yes. almost two weeks before this hurricane. And we ended up in a situation where we, uh, as soon as the rain started, uh, you don't have a, a terrible hurricane to to, to treat with. So um, I think the, the indicators are, are clear. In terms of uh, the fact that we are on the front lines, uh, there's no question about that. We are getting hit if it's not Grenada, it's Dominica, if it's not Dominica, it's the Bahamas. Uh, we can go on and on. Uh, we're the ones having to deal with these catastrophic events. We're the ones having to find the resources to rebuild and to safeguard the lives of our citizens and their, their livelihoods. And we are not being offered uh, grant funding to do so. We are not being offered concessional loans to do so. Uh, Dominica has become a heavily indebted country because it had to borrow uh, to rebuild uh, and to continue trying to build resilience uh, in its people. Grenada is going to have to do so. Barbados is going to have to do so as a result of, of, of this situation. St. Vincent and the Grenadines are going to have to do so. So when you borrow and you become more heavily indebted, it means the revenue you have from your tax base uh, or from any other sources essentially has to go back now to pay back loans, to rebuild infrastructure, schools, agriculture, etc. Um, and you have to pay it back to people who probably are themselves the contributors to this global uh, climatic challenge that we have. That's the vicious cycle that we're in. And in, in term, you said that there's no there's no grant funding, there's no concessional loans. The what has been the international response though to 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 Grenada in terms of of, of gifts, donations, and anything like that coming from the international partners? Uh, well, there has been, I mean, in terms of immediate relief efforts, uh, the the international community has, uh, and the regional community has has responded. Um, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, yes. So the, the regional uh, 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 community has certainly responded. CARICOM has, has been phenomenal, um, both in terms of the immediate hands-on assistance, in terms of uh, relief supplies, uh, in terms of uh, RSS soldiers by Antigua, Barbados, uh, the Guyana Defense Force, the Trinidad and Tobago government has sent in supplies, uh, gasoline uh, to assist us. Uh, they're sending in uh, linesmen uh, to help us with the restoration of uh, electricity. So to Dominica, St. Lucia. Uh, thankfully, the Prime Ministers of Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Kitts, they visited Caracu yesterday with me. Uh, they've offered recognizing the level of destruction uh, to send in tradesmen and artisans to help us uh, with the restoration effort. Uh, as, as challenging as many of our brothers and sisters find themselves in, they have offered uh, uh, some uh, financial assistance, direct financial assistance. There are one or two regional uh, organizations as well, um, starting from our central bank, that have pledged some uh, financial assistance. And we are eternally grateful for that. The uh, Chinese government, through the Chinese Red Cross, has pledged 100,000 US. Uh, the United States government initially pledged 100,000 US through uh, their Red, uh, Red Cross regional bodies as well. Um, I've just received word from the uh, US ambassador that, that an additional million dollars will be pledged. The uh, Canadian government, uh, through the Minister for International Development and Cooperation, has also pledged uh, a million dollars. Uh, the Caribbean Development Bank has pledged, uh, I think, around half a million dollars. Now, we are absolutely thankful uh, for all of these, these contributions. The Angola government has pledged 250000 so in that sense, there has been some uh, offers of assistance and financial pledges. And we have also put out our own financial pledge uh, where private citizens, uh, sympathizers, supporters can make financial contributions. But I want to say this. Uh, these sums, uh, uh, when added up, will be a, a drop in the ocean. Uh, and to a large extent, will simply go towards the immediate provision of relief supplies. Uh, and I'll just give you an example of what I'm meaning. Just to address the, the, the relief and the ability to distribute aid within Caribou, uh, the government had to purchase 11 vehicles, uh, which easily will run us into a million plus dollars. Uh, we're talking pickups and trucks just to be able to distribute food. Uh, we have 
had to obviously uh, retain barges and other ships to take all the the the, the release supplies up to 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 Karakou. Uh, we've had to charter planes to be able to take people to and from Karakou. So just the transportation costs, just the logistics involved in actually bringing the release supplies is going to run us into the the the, 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 the million dollars. dollars. So um, the the truth is, you know, there is no. Uh, significant grant funding uh, when we add all of this up uh, to address that. So the cleanup alone, I mean, there's an enormous amount of, of, of debris, enormous, that has been created in Caribbean PT Market. This will run us into millions of dollars. It will probably take us uh, 90 to 120 days just to, to, to clean up the galvanized, the zinc, the lumber, you know, the, the glass and all of the things that, that, you know, the furniture, the bits and pieces of wood that is strewn all over the place. Um, it is going to take a lot of manual labor to do so. Um, because it's in the mangrove, it's on the beaches, it's, it's everywhere. So yes, um, there is really no grant funding in any significant capacity uh, outside of the pledges that our partners and so on have made. There is no readily available international grant relief. I want to thank the government and the people of Trinidad and Tobago for their tremendous outpourings of support, uh, encouragement, uh, solidarity, uh, material assistance. Um, you know, in 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 this time and their continued support, um, we really do uh, appreciate it. Uh, it uh, reminds us of Black Stalin, the Caribbean man, uh, and that we all, you know, one people. And so, again, thank you to the people of Trinidad and to Tobago for the continued support uh, in our relief and restoration efforts. Prime Minister, we want to thank you as well. We know it's it's you 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 probably have a very busy day, not probably. I'm sure you have a very busy day ahead of you. But we want, on behalf of all of us at Altos, we'd really like to thank you for taking this time to to be with us and to congratulate you. You're the youngest youngest. Kid on the block, so to speak, in terms of the prime in terms of prime ministers in the region, and all the best to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate God. it. God bless. Take care. Take care. Thanks. Here's a look at some events upcoming in the Archdiocese. Catholic News editor Raymond Sims gives us a preview of what's in this week's edition of the Catholic News. In this Sunday's issue, Presentation College Shaguana celebrates 65 years of excellence. Participant Ryan Bechu shares on his weekend experience of monastic life at Mount St. Benedict. And following the passage of Hurricane Beryl, Father Stefan Alexander asserts in the Catholic Commission for Social Justice column that God isn't a trini, he's all a week. I am Raymond Sims, editor of the Catholic News. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Altos. Remember, you can send your correspondence to us at altos at catholictt.org. Following Holy Mass at St. Dominic's Pina, the congregation made their way into the churchyard for the annual harvest. There were a variety of stalls, but the main attraction was Father Robert Christo, who mingled with parishioners, young and old, and participated in a late evening dance with the young people of the community. It was the last function for Father Christo as he's now been reassigned to Santa Rosa Parish Arima. We leave you with these sight and sounds. Have a good week. <laughs>